Today's study is study number eight, entitled The Empty Tomb. And the picture here portrays a, a modern tomb, not the kind of tomb that Jesus was buried in, but it does portray an empty tomb and the grave clothes. And the other symbol is uh, the statement of Jesus that he would not leave us orphanless, that is, as orphans, I should say, but that the Holy Spirit would be given. And uh, so for the rest, we are uh, here to add in the important concepts as given in the uh, Gospels and the New Testament letters about the resurrection theme. One of the very most important themes in all of Scripture. And I must add one of the teachings of Scripture that has drawn a lot of uh, discussion and sometimes denial. I have uh, before me here uh, something that happened to uh, our neighbors to the north in Canada, but it happens in our country as well and around the world where uh, people who are a part of the Christian family uh, debate and discuss and sometimes deny what we're going to talk about here today. Here is uh, a statement from uh, uh, the Orange County Register and it uh, is a copy from uh, an event that happened in Toronto, Canada, and it reads as follows. Canada's largest Protestant denomination, the United Church of Canada, has become a flashpoint for bitter debate among Canadian Christians after its leader questioned the divinity and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Reverend Bill Phillips sparked the nationwide debate in October when he said in an interview that he did not believe Christ was God, uh, was bodily resurrected, or that he was the only way to God. And then the church general council met and they supported the moderator uh, unanimously, indicating that uh, he was well within the spectrum of the United Church. And the closing part of that article, uh, Phipps makes this comment. Uh, let me explain. I uh, believe that Jesus was as much of the nature of God as we can see in human beings. And, and this is the part that uh, we want to uh, focus on right now. It has to do with the resurrection. And Jesus was resurrected, but spiritually in the hearts of people rather than bodily. So immediately we understand that there are a lot of people that uh, look at the gospel narrative of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and do a different take on it than we will hear in this study. And I must hasten to add, it's a different take than what is found in the statements that compose what we call the historic Christian faith. Sometimes people say, well, what is the historic Christian faith? And uh, I, it is that continuum of body of teachings, the cardinal and essential teachings of Scripture that you can trace in the life of the church all the way from the apostolic period on into the present time. And sometimes those teachings existed not in the main body of the church, but always God has people, groups, and folk who uphold these basic teachings of Scripture. And while we don't profess that this is a perfect statement of the historic Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed is often taken as a historic statement of the summary or the basic tenets of what we hold to be cardinal. And that has been a part of that continuum. Now, for my part, I would hesitate a long, long time before I would step out and divert or deviate in my beliefs from the historic Christian faith. There's been a lot of prayer, there's been a lot of study, and the people have been devout people who have hammered out these creeds. They've been people who I believe have been guided by God's Spirit. And for us to stand in our day 
and then to push that aside and say we're living in a day when we have a better understanding, I think should be done very, very slowly. Now the Apostles' Creed makes a very clear statement. Jesus Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified. He died and was buried. And then it talks a little later about he arose again on the third day. A simple, clear statement <coughs> that is meant to be taken at its face value as a literal historical statement about uh, this central doctrine of the Christian faith. So we're going to take a look at our worksheet and I have something like six concepts in the worksheet and I give a lot of biblical references there. Some of them are typed out and a few of them I'll read for you and we're going to walk together uh, to deal with this wonderful teaching about uh, the resurrection and Easter faith. It is a great historic document and it has a tremendous amount of significance in our lives today. Now, before we talk about this matter of a physical resurrection or a spiritual resurrection, or as Phipps put it, a bodily resurrection or a spiritual resurrection, we need to deal with a subject of the death of Christ. And even at that point, there is some deviation and disagreement. So the first concept on your worksheet is simply this. Jesus died a physical death and he identified with us in that death. In other words, all of us, if the Lord tarries, are going to die. The mortality rate is exactly 100%. And I don't look for that to change. <laughs> if the Lord tarries, it'll remain 100%. Jesus identified with us in the way he came into the world and he identifies with us in the way he left as he left the existence that he had in that bodily form and was, was laid in the grave. He died. Now his death obviously was exponentially heavier and had far greater consequences and was far more, what, serious than our departure from this life. We all understand that. But it nonetheless was a departure from his earthly existence in his bodily state in the same way you and I will depart. Well, let's take a look first of all at uh, uh, the gospel record. And I'll read the second reference in Mark 15. Notice how it, uh, it just simply states it in very clear, literal, historical reporting kind of form. As the evening approached, Joseph from Arimathea went to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead, so he called for the Roman military officer in charge and asked him. The officer confirmed the fact. Notice that. The officer confirmed the fact, and Pilate told Joseph he could have the body. Now well, that's just a straight statement of Christ's death. And the people there in charge said that he was dead and he was laid in a tomb. Now, Hebrews 9, obviously, is one of the epistles and it assumes that same fact and it makes a statement. Just as it is destined for each person to die only once, that kind of undercuts the reincarnation concept, doesn't it? to die, and to die only once, and after that comes the judgment. So also cried, uh, Christ died only once as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. Now, in the course in the MAD program called Apologetics, uh, you had a chance, and others of you will have a chance soon, to go through a lot of the theories about the resurrection that were detractors or denials of the actual resurrection. And for those of you who read through that text, you'll notice that one of the theories on the part of these detractors was the swoon theory. The swoon theory simply posits that Christ on the cross did not actually die, 
but that he swooned and sort of passed out and was taken for dead, laid in the tomb, and in the cool tomb revived again and then walked away and appeared to his disciples and other groups and he did not really die and was not really resurrected. He just simply swooned and then reappeared. And they put the construction on it that he was resurrected. That is that theory. And it is just that. And I know that you read the comment on the part of the writer evaluating that theory. And it goes something like this. That uh, Christ would have been a deceiver had he only swooned and allowed the disciples to think that he had actually risen from the dead. It was the truth of the resurrection that impelled the believers to spread the gospel, not a deception and a lie. You cannot build a church, you cannot build a Christian movement such as we have on something that is false and is a deception such as that. And so we simply affirm Jesus died a physical death. Now, let me take a second to read a passage of scripture that talks about the fact that he identified with us in death. And sometimes people say, well, of course he did. To die is to die, isn't it? Well, we do have a couple of illustrations in scripture about people who did not die. Anybody remember any of those? Enoch. Enoch, that's right. And in the book of Genesis, you read, he walked with God, and he was no more, for God took him. And that's affirmed, repeated, in Hebrews chapter 11. And so the word that the expositors use is that Enoch was translated. He didn't die. Now, there's another illustration in the Old Testament, and that's Elijah. <coughs> Elijah put his mantle on Elisha as his successor. They went to the Jordan. And that's right. He went up in a whirlwind, and God took him. Now, how about God doing the same for Jesus? Did he? And he did not. He did not. Jesus exited his earthly existence with that human body of flesh and blood in the same way we will. And so in Hebrews, it makes that statement. And I'm reading from chapter 2 and verse 14. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, Jesus also became flesh and blood, being born in human form. That's a way of saying Jesus identified with us in the birth process. He had a human mother and was born of Mary just the way you and I had a human mother and were born in that same process. Continuing the reading. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he deliver those who have lived all their lives as slaves to what? The fear of dying. And we're going to talk about that in a second and discuss how do we view dying? It is a fact that all of us will face and the Bible has something to say about that. So let's go on to the second concept. Jesus had a physical, literal, real death, number one. Number two, Christ's resurrection broke the power of physical death. Now, don't let that just fly right over the top of your head as, as just a bunch of idle words. The, think of these words. And really, it's an almost a direct quote from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Here's how uh, Paul writes it. Jesus Christ, our Savior, who broke the power of death and shows us the way of everlasting life through the good news. So under 
line in that passage in red broke the power of death. There it is. And some older translations say he abolished death. Death still happens. So it wasn't abolished in the sense that it is no longer going to be our experience. But it's abolished in the sense that Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now if there's one chapter that you want to remember as the resurrection chapter. That is to say the chapter in the letters that follow the Gospels that really does lay out the whole resurrection theme. It is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You can always remember that. And at the close of that chapter, you have Paul as a peon of praise, so to speak. He said, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what is meant in the word that he has abolished death. He takes the sting out of it and the victory the last enemy is death, according to that same chapter, the 26th verse. And he has simply demolished that enemy. And we need to ask ourselves the question, is, is that how it all goes in life today? Yeah. Is that wonderful theme something we've wrapped our arms around sufficiently enough? In John R. W. Stott's uh, commentary on this passage in, uh, in, in 1 Timothy where he talks about abolishing death, it's 2 Timothy, by the way, uh, he makes a comment that uh, we really, in society, uh, are afraid of death. And uh, he quotes, and I've Observer magazine in Britain that devoted a lot of space to the subject of death. That's not a popular subject, but they were bold enough to put on an issue that really highlighted it. And he quotes from that magazine. It talks about how society looks at death. Far from being prepared for death, modern society has made the very word almost unmentionable. We have brought all our talents into use to avoid the prospect of dying. And when the time comes, we react with anything from excessive triviality to abject despair. And then he says, one of the most searching tests to apply to any religion concerns its attitude toward death. And measured by this test, much so-called religion is really found wanting. There is a popular uh, name uh, in the movie Making Business, uh, uh, Woody Allen, who has come to be known as a person who uh, really is afraid of death and sometimes likes to joke about it, but it's, it's really something that concerns him. And in this particular book, uh, they have a quote from Esquire magazine that deals with a statement that Woody Allen made, and he probably speaks for a large part of society. It says, this is Woody Allen's quote, the fundamental thing behind all motivation and all activity is the constant struggle against annihilation and against death. It's absolutely stupefying in its terror and it renders anyone's accomplishments meaningless. That's Woody Allen. An interviewer was asking him about, are you really that afraid of death? And Woody Allen quipped, I'm not really afraid of death. It's just that I don't want to be around when it happens. <laughs> and so, all right. So what we need to do is to take the questions that we have in our worksheet and we need to take what we have affirmed so far. Christ died a death and identifies with what we need to go through. Secondly, Christ broke the power of death. He took the sting out of it. 
And so the question that I want you to do in your table groups is, you know, what guidance does the Bible give us about this subject for believers? 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18 is the reference that I give you. There may be other passages, but that's a key one. Can you accept the counsel that is in that passage? Or is there some part of the death issue that is a struggle for you? Should we talk about it? I ask the question, society tends to cloak the issue, but is this the best way? Is that better than facing it? So we're going to take a break and get into your table groups and discuss those questions. And we go to concept number three in our worksheet. The resurrection of Christ is an historical and literal fact. And the reason we underscore that is because there are a lot of people who don't buy that. It is an historical fact. There are parts in the Bible that deal with a lot of symbolism. And they need to be treated as that kind of literature. Apocalyptic literature, for example, needs to be treated and interpreted that way. So you take what the meaning of the symbols refer to, and you don't take the apocalyptic statement literally. But when you come to sections of scripture that are just straight reporting, they are historical narrative, you take them as they state the information, literally. You recall the study in Old Testament number two, and talked about all the different kinds of literature. Well, friends, that's an important study because a lot of times people will do violence to the body, uh, to the uh, scripture by uh, uh, treating things that are historical symbolically. And that is what is done with this concept. Now, I'll talk about that in a second, but let's take a look at the biblical narrative first. The New Testament treats the resurrection of Christ historically, and it treats it literally. All four Gospels report the resurrection scene with real people. There's the soldiers at the tomb real people. There's the women who come to the tomb. There's the, the Peter and John who rush to the tomb. And the uh, New Testament gives this narrative with reference to actual time on the first day of the week. That's historical reporting. And an actual place, the gospel narrative says, on the first day of the week, the women followed and saw, no, no, this would be on Friday, the women followed and saw the place where they laid the body. That's in the gospel narrative. The women saw the place where they laid the body. Now, friends, that's not to be taken symbolically. That is straightforward information. Now, I make a statement here that some choose to sidestep the historical reality of Christ's resurrection and instead talk of a spiritual resurrection. And that's exactly uh, what the moderator of the United Church uh, in Canada uh, has done. And that's why that debate rages on. Not everybody in that church. That's the largest denomination in Canada. It's a combination of Presbyterian, Congregational, and Methodist churches of past years. It's a large denomination. And he's taken a stand to say it is spiritual. Now, I've, I've, I've come across this a number of times, and it kind of goes like this, at least for some people. Some people will say it's like Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln lives today. They mean he lives spiritually. They mean that his memory lives on. That the legacy of what he was about as a statesman and as a leader of our country, those principles and those concepts are with us today. And so they say Abraham is alive today. They mean his memory is alive and his legacy is alive. Now that's true for Jesus Christ too, but that isn't what the New Testament 
means when it talks about Christ being risen and alive today. It means that he is alive literally and factually with a bodily resurrection. And so I ask the question, is this what Easter means to you? And with that, we're going to stop and uh, have some open floor discussion about this and follow up on some of the previous discussion of our last <laughs> talk about facing death. So we'll break at this point and discuss. As we begin again, I want to give you a wrap-up statement that really ties together uh, that question that you had for discussion about a spiritual resurrection. That is a very common concept. What is that spiritual resurrection? Well, we talked about that, but here's my good friend F.F. F. Bruce's comment about it in his book, Jesus, Lord and Savior. And uh, he knows that that idea is very much prevalent in and around the world. And he writes, it's easy for us today to talk of a spiritual resurrection and emphasize that this is what is really important. What does it matter if John Brown's baby body lies a moldering in the grave, so long as his soul goes marching on? But that is not what the followers of Jesus meant when they spoke of his resurrection in the first century AD, and that is not what their hearers understood them to mean. By resurrection, they meant the resurrection of the body. If they had meant only that the spirit and power of Jesus lived on, resurrection is not the word they would have used. Moreover, even if they had used this word to mean that Jesus' spirit and power and memory lived on, their proclamation would have been pointless if his body was still in the tomb. Now notice this, if his body was still in the tomb. See, that's what you have to have if you have a spiritual resurrection. It would have been pointless if his body was still in the tomb or in some other place to which it had been moved. It has to be somewhere if there is no resurrection bodily. If you only have a spiritual resurrection, then the body is an issue. It has to be there or someplace where it's been placed. Now, he goes on to say, the authorities would simply have organized visits to the place to demonstrate that he had not risen from the dead. And Christianity would never have gotten off the ground. Indeed, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, we should probably never have heard of him. That's right on. That's right on. Yes, question. What about cre uh, cremation? <laughs> cremation. <laughs> the Bible does not speak about, uh, uh, you know, the, that particular issue. Uh, the Bible's emphasis is not on the remains. The Bible's emphasis is on to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My personal opinion is that cremation ha is not inconsistent with the Christian emphasis. And I know there are Christian leaders who say that in the Old Testament you have a lot made of the fact that Abraham bought a burial site and that is where is called today the, the, in Hebron, the burial place of the patriarchs. And that's where they were laid to rest. The New Testament does not uh, have that equal emphasis at all on, on grave sites and literal burials. Uh, bodily burials. So the New Testament doesn't make a lot of it. And I suppose it's a matter of conscience. What do you feel is the, the, the proper thing? I think the scripture, this is my opinion, allows for both. Now with that, let's move on to concept number four. Concept number four in your worksheet simply says, the resurrection of Christ is well attested. And again I must say, 
that when you do your homework and reading in the apologetics course, you will read through a lot of the information and material that deals with the fact that this is one of the best legally and historically attested things that you've got in scripture. It is not something that stands on shaky grounds. Lee Strubel's recent book of, uh, is, is a wonderful treatment of, of this, uh, this very thing. And there are many, many uh, books that are available today. And I simply want to allude to uh, the scripture, clearly affirms it, and then I want to allude to a second thing, extra biblical evidence, and that is what the resurrection produced is eloquent testimony of its truth. First, take a look with me at the fact that there are in the scripture many references to post-Easter appearances, okay? And I'll simply read two of them. But there are at least 10 or more recorded in the Gospels and in the letters of where Christ after Easter appeared to a person or to a small group or to 500 at one time. I'm reading now from that resurrection chapter in 1 uh, Corinthians 15. And uh, I'll begin the reading at verse 3 and go for a couple of verses and just listen to uh, what Paul has to say. I passed on to you what was most important and what has uh, also been passed on to me that Christ died for our sins, that's number one, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day according to scriptures. Now Paul says that is of utmost importance. And then he goes on to say this is attested in scripture by Christ's appearances. In other words, He's affirming that Christ knew that what had transpired was so revolutionary, was so highly significant, that these appearances were of utmost importance if the whole Christian faith was to be a movement that would step on out and march forward. It had to be that people would say, this blows my mind. We are now in a whole new perspective in terms of life and death and the key issues of life. And so these appearances happen. Now Paul lists a few. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12 apostles. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. And then he goes on to say, he doesn't name the road to Damascus, but he's referring to that encounter that he had with the living Christ on the road to Damascus, and he saw the Lord. And he said, last of all, I saw him too. <coughs> now, a reference to an appearance that is seldom referred to, but is really a wonderful insight in terms of the 40 days that Jesus had after Easter and before the Ascension. 40 days when these appearances happened. But here's, here's the statement. Now you're gonna be reading the book of Acts. And I mean to tell you that is, you know, can you have more wonderful reading than the Gospels? Well, no, I guess you can't. But the book of the Acts of the Apostles, or as some have said, the Acts of the Holy Spirit is exciting reading. It tells you what happened as a result of Easter. But at any rate, we're talking now about the 40 days. And in this first chapter of the book of Acts, you have this statement. During the 40 days after his crucifixion, Christ appeared to the apostles from time to time and proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. Now, on these occasions, he talked to them about the kingdom of God. For our many years, I did not see that verse, and I did not realize 
that the 40 days were strong instructional teaching times of Jesus with the apostles. Wow, that's wonderful. But that's one of the appearances that I think we can underscore. All right, now what about the extra biblical evidence? And at this point, I just simply want to point to the early Christian church. The early Christian church, a small band gathered in the upper room, sorting out what it really meant that Christ, in fact, had conquered sin and death and Satan. What does that mean? And I believe that they came to an dawning awareness that when Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand, they began to see, now we understand what the kingdom of God is about. They began to wrap their arms around that in faith and in full trust and said, this is the greatest thing that has ever happened in the world. And because they were people who understood something of the Old Testament, they must have gone back and said what God originally created and which was despoiled by disobedience on the part of humankind. God said he would reconstruct. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing and by you all families of the earth will be blessed. God is in the business of restoring and redeeming and repairing what and reclaiming what humankind has despoiled. And in the Christ event, his death, his burial, his resurrection, where he has victory over sin and death and Satan, that's it. That's how all of this happens. And the kingdom of God is at hand. And we've got to get this good news out. So I think they probably said, well, nothing has changed in a way. The reality is still on that Rome is under, is, is still dominating Palestine. That hasn't changed. Believers of Jesus Christ are people who are being held suspect. We've got kind of a, a penalty over our heads. That's why we're meeting behind closed doors. That hasn't changed. They were after Jesus, they're after us. <coughs> evil is still abroad, that hasn't changed. So everything is the same, except the Christ event is now the new reality. This is no longer the ultimate reality. The Christ event is the new reality. And we will be kingdom people and we will live as kingdom people and share the news of God's kingdom. Have you noticed that in the Gospels that so much of the teaching of Jesus Christ, especially the parables, were parables about the kingdom? And we ought to ask ourselves, do we understand what that means? Do we understand what it means that the kingdom of God is at hand? It is one of the greatest, the greatest event that has ever happened in history. And they were witnesses of it. And so they went out, and it spread, and they were persecuted. And the historians look back at the early Christian church that began to grow and to spread and to spread, and they said, the blood of the martyrs has become the seed of the church. That's a classic statement. The blood of the martyrs has become the seed of the church. Why? because they wrapped their arms around the resurrection faith. That's the ultimate reality, they said. That changes everything. Nothing has changed, but everything has changed because of the Christ event. So the history of these people who were despondent and defeated and disillusioned and who had gone back to their fishing trade, now changed and you watch them as they walk through the book of Acts, and you ask, what brought that 180-degree change? 
It is the Christ event, his death and resurrection. That is what changed. That's the foundation. And they were empowered by the Spirit. That's it. And friends, that's still it for you and for me. That has not changed. That has not changed. Which leads us uh, to uh, a section on the top of your page, your worksheet on the flip side, which is concept and teaching number five. Maybe you thought as we spent time sorting things out about Christ's resurrection being historical and literal, that it was bodily resurrection. Maybe the thought flitted through your mind, are you making a lot ado over something that we ought not to be thinking about? I mean, why should we bother ourselves about some of these deviations and try to sort things out and, and try to understand it more specifically? The answer to that is, no, that is not time wasted. This is not something that only eggheads ought to think about. This is something that every Christian needs to unfold with a sense of enthusiasm. Now, if we don't believe that, all we need to do is to turn to the resurrection chapter and take a look at verse 19 forward and ask the question, if it didn't happen, what are the consequences. So what I want to do is to have you work individually, turn to that passage, it's given in your worksheet, and I give you empty space on your worksheet to list down what the consequences are if, in fact, the resurrection of Christ did not transpire as portrayed in Scripture. Okay, let's take a break and you go to your worksheet. And uh, it's concept number six in your study sheet. Believers are given rich blessings by Christ's resurrection. And I list four key blessings that come to believers as they view Christ's resurrection and wrap their arms around that and say, that's for me. This is where I stand. This is what I believe. Here is my Lord who gave his life for me. And this is what it means to me personally. The first, it assures us of our bodily resurrection, our own personal bodily resurrection. God isn't done with our bodies. He created them, and one day they're laid to rest in the grave, but they will be resurrected. And Paul in the resurrection chapter says that it was an earthly body, and now it'll be a heavenly body. It'll be like the glorious body that Jesus Christ had after Easter. And the references there are <clears throat> Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21. Maybe I should read that for you. It is a beautiful, beautiful statement. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. We're members of the kingdom. We're kingdom people. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take these weak, mortal bodies of ours. That's the body that's laid to rest in the grave. Or cremated. Mm -hmm. Or lost at sea. Or who knows what. Reconstituted. God who created is able to recreate. He will take these weak, mortal bodies of ours and change them into glorious bodies like his own. This is one of the passages. There are others. And in the resurrection chapter, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Christ is the first fruit and we are the harvest. And in the book of Leviticus, the people would understand what the first fruit concept meant. It meant that when the barley harvest 
was gathered that the farmer would take the sheaf of that barley harvest and bring it to the priest and the priest would wave it before the Lord, dedicated to the Lord. That was the background of that reference. And the concept is that that first sheaf is representative of the rest of the harvest. It is the precedent of the rest of the harvest. The first sheep, yes, and the rest of the sheaves will come in like manner, in like manner. So I'll read that reference. But the fact is that Christ has been raised from the dead. He has become the first of the great harvest of those who we've raised, raised to life again. Christ was raised first, then when Christ comes back, all his people will be raised. Second benefit that the believer receives from Christ's resurrection. It provides us with power to live the Christian life and carry out his ministry. Now for many, many years, I did not see that as a benefit of the resurrection. The Heidelberg Catechism lists three benefits of Christ's resurrection. And this is one of them. The first one is there and the second one as well, and we'll look at the third in a moment. But this is there. And at the end of your Bethel study, Harley Swigum, the author, writes in bold print, would you say that the resurrection event is not only event, but also process? And you may have wondered, what does that mean? This teaching is what it means. The power of Christ's resurrection is not relegated to three days back in about 33 AD. You got that? Tremendous things happened in Christ's death and resurrection as a power center. But the New Testament does not allow us to think that that is all that that means, as much as it means. Now listen to some of the verses. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as he raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal body. Now, our mortal body, as referenced there, does not refer to a dead body. It refers to the body we're living in right now. Our mortal body right now. He says, it will give life to your mortal body by this same spirit living within you. You know, for years I wondered what that phrase in Philippians 3.10 meant. And the old translation said that Paul gave this, these words. Now listen, that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And I thought, what is Paul referring to there? And then as I studied more in years past, I began to see what Paul is saying is that the power that God used to raise Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that he now makes available to you and to me to live out the Christian life. That's what he says. And in that sense, the resurrection is not only event, a tremendous power impact in his death and resurrection. But that power now is available to be infused in your life and mine. Now, that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection, I go to first Ephes the Ephesians chapter 1, and I find out that it's a prayer that, that Paul prays for the believers. Now, I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. I pray that you will begin to understand, I pray that you will begin to understand the incredible greatness of his power for us who believe in him. Now, what power is he talking about? Notice the next phrase. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. And Paul says, I pray, and this is a prayer for believers, I pray that you will understand that. 
If we don't understand it, we will not seek it. If we do not seek it, we will not know that power. It is not automatically infused to us. But Paul is saying there is a process to the resurrection that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection for day by day living in this, our mortal bodies. I think that really is a wonderful, wonderful teaching and something that we need to be talking to God about because there's far more that God makes available to us than we sometimes understand and sometimes desire. If we don't understand it, we will not desire it. And that's why Paul is saying, my prayer for you is that you will understand it in order that you may seek the resurrection power in your mortal body for your day-by-day -day living. The writers of the Heidelberg Catechism saw that, and they put that down as one of the main blessings of the resurrection. That's process. That's day-by-day -day living. And you and I need Christ's resurrection power to give life to our mortal bodies day by day. Item number three, and the, the last two here are much more common and probably do not take as much time for us to talk about, but they're important. Item number three, it makes possible his presence with us now and always. Jesus said before he ascended, lo, I am with you to the end of the age. Here he says, no, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you in just a little while. The world will see me again, will not see me again, but you will, for I will live again, and you will too. The Father sends the Counselor as my representative, and by Counselor I mean the Holy Spirit. And in the 16th chapter, Jesus follows those words up with these statements. But I am going away to the one who sent me, it is actually best for you that I go away because if I don't, the counselor won't come. If I do go away, he will come because I will send him to you. Albertus Peters, one of the great uh, Reformed Church uh, teachers at Western Theological Seminary of yesteryear and a missionary for 20 years in, uh, in Japan, a great evangelical scholar in my estimation, has a little book called Divine Lord and Savior. And he has a paragraph in there about this. I will not leave you orphanless. And he said, search the book of Acts as you will. Go through all the epistles as you want. And you will not find a shred of evidence of any of the apostles at any time, even when life was rough, saying, I wish Jesus were here like he was with us during those three years in Palestine. There is absolutely no reference to that. And in this passage, Jesus is saying, it is to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't, the Holy Spirit cannot be given. The Holy Spirit is Christ's presence with us now in a fuller and in a stronger way than they even knew when he was physically with them, walking the dusty paths of Judea and Galilee. Hallelujah, I mean, that's terrific, all right? He is a living Christ. That's why he can be present in such a way, by the power of his spirit. I serve a risen savior. He walks with me and talks with me along life's way. That's what this means. Now let's go to the last one. It confirms that Christ's cross atoned for our sins and made us right with God. Okay? You got that one? What does that mean? Well, the scripture references should be read first and we'll talk about it. He was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised from the dead to make us right with God. Romans 4.25 For God made Christ who never sinned to be offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Jesus Christ. Now, I have a question. How is Easter like a ticker tape parade down Fifth Avenue? If you have watched some of the, the films of the ending of World War II, 
And then that marvelous victory parade down Fifth Avenue and all the confetti and all of the vans marching. And, and uh, this was a, a high moment. And the question is, let me make it a statement. Easter is like that. That was a high moment in our nation because it said mission accomplished, victory attained. And Easter says what Christ set out to do when he said, I will take this cup because it is your will, Father. And he went to the cross that he accomplished atonement for sin, victory over Satan, and the conquest of the grave. He accomplished it. And Easter is the ticker tape parade of the believer saying, mission accomplished, victory attained. What you said has been completely fulfilled. That's what Easter is. And that's why the early believer said, this is a centerpiece of our faith and we will change our worship day from the seventh day to the first day because it was on the first day that he arose from the dead. And we will celebrate Easter every Sunday. That's a part of what this means. Now, I'm going to wrap this up by asking this last question. We've been talking about victory. We've been talking now just the last few moments about a ticker tape parade of mission accomplished. But you and I are going to go and read tomorrow morning's newspaper and we're going to listen to the news on television or on the radio as we go to our work and we'll hear about this and this and this and this and we'll say, boy, that doesn't sound like Easter to me. And so Christ has conquered Satan and Christ is victor over sin and atoned for it. That's not the kind of world <laughs> we're living in. And we have to ask the question, how can that be? Because the Bible says that's been accomplished. And yet we don't see it accomplished. And one of the best illustrations that I've ever heard to help us to get a hold of this is an illustration that I believe comes from Emil Brunner, but it's about World War II. And he indicates as follows, that if you think of the Normandy invasion of World War II and the successful completion of the Battle of the Bulge that quickly ensued, that that was the time when the backbone of the Axis was broken. There was no question as to how the end was going to come out. The victory had been won, at least in principle. Now there was a lot of battle and war and loss of lives that ensued until the day in Tokyo Bay on the battleship Missouri, the armistice was signed. And then all the arms were laid down and there was peace and no more war. Now, that's an analogy of the whole Christ event, not only the first coming, but the second coming. The Normandy invasion and the Battle of the Bulge is comparable to what happened in Christ's death and resurrection. The backbone of Satan was broken and Christ arose victorious, no question about it. The battle goes on. Satan is at work. He knows his days are numbered. His backbone is broken, but he is vicious beyond compare. Until the day, and we don't know when that will come, when the armistice is signed and Christ returns and he's put underfoot in the lake of fire. And we're living in between the first and the second coming. It has been accomplished, but the armistice is not yet signed. And that is the Easter story. Now, does that make a difference in terms of how we live? You better believe it does. Yeah, you better believe it does. We need to live on the right side of Easter. And with that, we close our study.